All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Ike Hasley. Um, I am a sports medicine fellow at Mayo Clinic Square in Minneapolis. Um, prior to this, I did my training in physical medicine and rehabilitation at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And I'm now doing a fellowship in sports medicine. And so this is a non-operative sports medicine fellowship. And so we take care of a lot of athletes, uh, including uh, many of the pro uh, teams in the Minneapolis area, uh, also some college athletes, uh, but also the weekend warriors, uh, you know, people who are very active on the weekends, they have normal desk jobs and want to keep running or uh, playing whatever sport they enjoy on the weekends. Um, and also the aging athlete, people who uh, were previously high level athletes um, or played high school or college sports and want to continue being active. Um, because as we know, and as we're going to see in this lecture, uh, that carries with it a lot of benefits um, that are good for your overall musculoskeletal um, and physical um, and also your mental health as well. And so today we're going to be talking about cartilage and joint injuries. And so my background um, in physical medicine rehabilitation, this is a very broad field and we take care of everything from knee pain um, to spinal cord injuries. Um, people with amputations, um, people with brain injuries. We take care of pediatric patients, uh, people who have uh, chronic pain, um, such as low back or neck pain, um, and also uh, people who are, are high-level athletes and, and uh, participate in a lot of sports. So that's a little bit about me. Today, we're going to be talking about cartilage and joint injuries. This is part of the Charter House Lecture Series. And this talk will be going out um, uh, as a virtual recording on Monday, December 12th, 2022. So um, today we're gonna talk about, um, uh, we're gonna describe the most common causes of cartilage and joint injuries. We're gonna discuss the prevalence, diagnosis and management of osteoarthritis. We're gonna discuss some of the new and emerging treatments for uh, for this, such as uh, what's called stem cells, and we're going to get into that a little bit. And then we're going to discuss the diagnosis and the management of cartilage injuries. So osteoarthritis. Um, musculoskeletal pain is a very common cause of patients seeking medical care. Um, osteoarthritis is the most common cause of joint disease worldwide. It affects 10% of men and 18% of women over the age of 60. Uh, this causes debilitation, and this is through pain and loss of function. This has a significant socioeconomic cost associated with it, and it's uh, estimated to affect 1 to 2.5% 2 2 of GDP in developed countries. Why does osteoarthritis occur? Well, we don't entirely know, but there are certainly a lot of things that we know is associated with osteoarthritis. So congenital um, things, uh, things that you're born with, such as hip dysplasia, um, this occurs when uh, we know that the hip is a ball and socket sort of joint. So when that socket is small, um, this can lead to early osteoarthritis. Also on the flip side of that, something called femoral acetabular impingement. This is where the, the socket of the, the hip joint is actually too too large almost, and it can cause some over coverage. And that can cause what's called a cam lesion, which is a little bump on that, that ball. Um, and when that, when you're trying to flex your hip, those can kind of hit each other and that can cause cystic changes and lead to early osteoarthritis. One thing that we know is that there can be a tenfold increase of end stage hip osteoarthritis within five years in people who have this sort of cam or pincer or what we call impingement morphology. And um, this is possibly associated with uh, an increased, there's a possible increased risk with high activity during adolescence. So this is classic in people, um, you know, who, who wrestled or played football in high school. Other things, if someone is naturally um, predisposed to have an varus or valgus uh, limb alignment in their knees. So if your knee tends to go in or out um, just naturally. This can predispose you to osteoarthritis. 
people who have leg length inequalities, uh, if there's a difference of more than one centimeter, then it's actually that shortened limb that can have an increased risk of osteoarthritis. Um, and then other things such as poor quadriceps strength leading to knee osteoarthritis. So one thing that we know is if someone's muscles are weak or deconditioned, that puts more stress through the joint as opposed to somebody who has strong, stable muscles around that particular joint. Um, those muscles take on more of the forces that go through the joint. What else can cause osteoarthritis? Well, age is the strongest risk factor. It increases over time. Um, this is thought to be secondary to decreased regenerative capacity and accumulation of risk factors. So uh, the, the, the longer you're on this earth, the more likely you are to have some sort of injury that can predispose to osteoarthritis. Uh, it does affect women more commonly than men. Um, there's thought to be possibly a hormonal role, um, whether that's estrogen or other hormones, uh, but this is very poorly understood overall, and that's something that we're constantly trying to figure out and um, that needs more research. If someone has a prior knee injury, this increases the risk of osteoarthritis uh, by about four times. Um, also, obesity increases the risk of osteoarthritis by about three times. Um, one thing that um, one of the one of the giants in in the physical medicine and rehab as well as sports medicine field, Dr. Um, Ed Laskowski, um, he would often quote, you know, if you lose one pound here, so if you if you lose one pound, um, that will decrease the forces going through your knee joint by about four pounds. So if you can imagine, if you are losing, uh, if you lose ten pounds, that's 40 pounds of decreased forces going through that knee joint. <clears throat> Another thing that can cause osteoarthritis or is linked to osteoarthritis is genetics. So some people are just predisposed to this. If they have a family history of osteoarthritis, then they're more likely to have osteoarthritis. And there have been many gene locuses or loci um, that have been uh, identified that is associated with osteoarthritis. So how do we diagnose this? Well, a lot of osteoarthritis diagnosis can be clinical. Um, this is based on patient symptoms, usually in the form of pain, decreased range of motion, and swelling of those joints. So sometimes we can look at a knee and tell if there's any edema within that knee joint, um, which is uh, referred to as an effusion. This often leads to um, us getting radiographs or plain film x-rays of the joints. Uh, there are some hallmarks of osteoarthritis um, that, that we can identify it by looking at these plain film x-rays. This is usually joint space narrowing. So as we see uh, out here on the outside of this uh, left knee, you can see that the joint space is a little bit more preserved uh, compared to the inside of this knee, where we've got some bone on bone um, osteoarthritis here. You can also have subchondral cystic changes. Um, so you'll see what's like little holes or lucencies in the bone. That means that bone is kind of breaking down. On the opposite side of that spectrum, you can have some chondral sclerosis. So when that bone breaks down, it tries to heal itself and lay down more bone, which is um, kind of harder and wider on plain film radiographs. You can have, also have marginal osteophytes. And so uh, again, that's part of that uh, attempt at the, the joint trying to heal itself where you'll, where you'll have osteophytes coming out here on the margins of the joint. Uh, the difficulty with this lies in the clinical timing. So uh, we know that treatment can be more effective in earlier or subclinical stages, but often when we see someone, the damage is, the cat's out of the bag, so to speak. The damage has already been done because they're already in pain. And so um, there's a lot of research going into how can we identify this earlier? Uh, part of that, well, people can get MRIs of their knees. Um, there's a somewhat new and developing technology called delayed gadolinium enhanced, enhanced MRI of cartilage or DGEMRIC. Um, and so this is an example of that where we, we're starting to see some uh, breakdown of uh, not only the, the cartilage, but that can also affect the, the bony um, aspects of the femur here and so there's some increased edema in the femur and what what they're doing here is breaking this knee joint down into different compartments and they're using that degemeric technology um, 
to see what compartments are most affected. Uh, this has been shown to correlate with a histo histological grade of osteoarthritis. And uh, we know that this is somewhat sensitive and we can detect changes um, within 10 weeks of an intervention. Other ways that we're trying to diagnose this earlier is uh, through biochemical markers. Um, so they'll use these markers, um, these substances in our, our blood or our urine um, to try to detect when someone might have osteoarthritis going on. And this is a, a very high level of, a very high um, area of interest that uh, people are uh, focusing a lot of research and studies on. These are a few examples of this cross-linked C2 of peptide or type of type 2 collagen or CTX2, um, N-terminal pro-collagen 3 pro-peptide, PII, I, and P, or uh, cartilage oligomeric matrix protein or COMP. Um, and so this is a lot of, um, like I said, uh, an area of high interest in research that's ongoing. How do we manage our arthritis? Well, there's a very broad range of ways that we can address arthritis. Oral medications like NSAIDs, um, such as ibuprofen or Aleve, um, Tylenol or acetaminophen, uh, this won't address the inflammatory aspect of um, arthritis very much, unlike NSAIDs. Tylenol affects the way that your brain is perceiving um, pain signals from your body. Turmeric is a high area of, uh, of interest, um, possibly more of like a natural supplement to decrease the inflammation in whatever joint you uh, are having inflammation in. Uh, also glucosamine, chondroitin, um, fish oil. These are common supplements that have also often been recommended. Um, unfortunately, there's limited or conflicting evidence that, that these have a significant effect on someone's life. Um, but often when people uh, think that this helps, uh, you know, as long as they're not taking too much of a certain medication and having um, other side effects from this, um, you know, we often say that the biggest risk of this is, is the uh, money that you drop at the grocery store when you're buying these. <clears throat> other, ways to get, other ways to get medication to an area, topical medications, so lidocaine or um, NSAID medications that is like a gel, such as Vol Voltaren gel that you can apply to the skin. This can be really useful for osteoarthritis and such as the small joints of the hands, uh, but uh, that would be difficult to penetrate all the way down to your hip joint if it's something like hip osteoarthritis. So this can be helpful, but can also be limited at the same, at the same time. Other ways that we address osteoarthritis, activity modification, so avoidance of further injury, um, weight loss, as I alluded to earlier, exercise capacity, physical therapy to focus on range of motion, stability, and strengthening. We can also use bracing, orthotics, or assistive devices. So a heel wedge can decrease some of the forces going through your knee. Um, same with a motor brace. You can use knee sleeves uh, to provide some extra stabilization um, and feedback to your knee. Uh, also canes and walkers to decrease the forces going through the knee. Kind of the last way that we get medications to a certain area is to inject the medication right into the joint. So corticosteroids were actually, um, this was develop, developed back in the day at Mayo Clinic. And this is a strong anti-inflammatory medication that we can deliver right to the knee. We often like to do these under ultrasound or um, x-ray guidance to make sure that we're getting that medication into the exact area that we want to. Other things such as visco supplementation or hyaluronic acid, this is the gel injections. Some people call these like a vitamin for the knee where they're restoring the normal um, fluid balance of the knee. Uh, this is what's called the, the rooster comb injections. So common brands are orthovisc, uh, monovisc, Uflexa, things like that. A new area of research um, is these orthobiologics or these regenerative medicine treatment options. One of the most popular being platelet-rich plasma, where we take your blood, we spin it down and um, concentrate the platelets in it. Um, and these platelets are, are thought to have anti-inflammatory properties. Um, and this has been shown to improve function over time. Uh, some of the stem cell options, such as BMAC or MFAT, this stands for bone marrow aspirate concentration or microfragmented adipose tissue, which we're gonna talk about more. Um, 
moving forward in this talk, um, these are the stem cells um, that people often hear about. Um, these are also called MSCs. So, so we're kind of getting away from the term stem cells um, and we're getting more towards mesenchymal, uh, mesenchymal signaling cells or mesenchymal stromal cells as a more accurate term for these instead of stem cells. Future directions, uh, they're con we're constantly trying to figure out new ways or um, new medications that we can inject to try to delay or stop the progression of osteoarthritis. Alpha-2 macroglobulin is somewhat like platelet-rich plasma, and that's um, a new and developing medication that's being studied uh, here at Mayo Clinic as we, as we speak. Lastly, um, surgical management is often indicated after failed medical management. This can be in the form of arthroscopic debridement or osteotomy, uh, or ultimately a total joint arthroplasty or total joint replacement. This is kind of the ultimate cure for osteoarthritis and is one of the most successful surgeries that we have, especially in the hip um, in the knee. And we're also constantly trying to improve uh, these surgeries and outcomes in other joints uh, throughout the body as well. So talking a little bit about MFET, this is a new and developing area. As I mentioned, this is short for microfragmented adipose tissue. Um, it's autologous, so it comes from the patient's own body. This is composed of fibroblasts, um, macrophages, adipocytes, mesenchymal stromal cells, or those MSCs. The adipose tissue is an easily accessible source for these MSCs or these stem cells. Um, and so what we do is we harvest this from someone's belly fat. We pull out that some of that fat or that adipose tissue, and then we wash it with saline and pass it through a filter to remove blood and oil products. This is thought to have regenerative properties. This is through cytokine secretion and angiogenic factors. This reduces the presence of those inflammatory elements and it promotes that anti-inflammatory uh, property of, of the knee um, or other joint. This is most commonly studied in the knee. And so that's why we often refer to the knee when talking about these treatment options. So this is just an example from uh, the Lipogems website, which is, um, a commercial product of someone who offers this treatment. And so uh, this is a person's belly. And as you can see, the physician here is using a needle to enter the belly and it is pulling off some of these, um, these fat cells. So uh, does this work? There have been multiple animal studies that show that uh, there, there may be some cartilage regeneration and there is some improvement of the symptoms of osteoarthritis. The human studies that we have um, are limited, uh, but these demonstrate pain and functional improvement in knee osteoarthritis. These are cohort-based, and we don't have a lot of randomized controlled trials to support this. Uh, it can be used as safe surgical adjuvant in ACL or LCL reconstruction, meniscectomy, or other surgeries. Um, and again, a lot of these are cohort-based, and we don't have a control group. So we're really trying to develop more robust studies in this area. Uh, this is a study in which patients with moderate to severe osteoarthritis were treated with one of these in MFET injections. Those with more, um, or sorry, less severe arthritis seem to have better improvements with these, uh, but a majority of the, the patients in this study did see significant functional and quality of life improvements. The next study um, uh, by a group, Dr. Berea, who trained here at Mayo Clinic, uh, they compared MFAT injections to platelet-rich plasma injections under ultrasound guidance. And they found a, a meaningful improvement in um, these scores that measure knee pain uh, compared to their baseline, but they didn't show a difference between the PRP and the MFAT groups. <coughs> This was a similar study out of a group of Italy who, again, looked at platelet-rich plasma versus MFAT injections. Again, they saw improvements with both um, injections through two years, but they did not see a significant difference in the outcomes, um, adverse events, or failures between the groups. They did think that more uh, patients getting MFAT injections uh, with moderate to severe OA reached um, clinically significant uh, improvement, but they did not see any changes in their x-rays or their MRI findings. 
So does it regenerate cartilage? We're not really sure. Uh, there's no convincing evidence that that says there's anatomic tissue regeneration. Uh, however, uh, one group looked at uh, MFAT injection plus surgery versus only surgery, and they saw that uh, those getting MFAT achieved uh, better results at six months. Their radiologic findings were similar compared to their baseline. So no, di no difference in their, in like their joint space narrowing in their radiographs, but they did see significant differences um, in their MRI scores in various compartments of the knee. And so this is just looking at that picture again, where they broke it down into various compartments. And those who received that MFAT injections actually had better scores and less edema compared to the control group who only got surgery. And so that's promising um, in our eyes that, you know, maybe there is something going on here with these MFAT or stem cell injections um, where there may be some regenerative properties. But um, this, this wasn't significant for us to, to, um, to confidently say that this is regenerating um, tissues. Moving on to cartilage injuries. Um, so this often happens because um, cartilage can have poor blood supply, and this means that it has poor healing as well. These cartilage injuries are most common in weight-bearing joints. Um, articular cartilage injuries and defects of the knee are common, and this can affect athletes or highly active people. And this usually occurs when the physical demands of whatever activity they're doing exceeds, uh, exceeds the um, regenerative capacity of the joint. This can be due to acute trauma or chronic repetitive damage and overuse. The prevalence is 16% in the general population and higher, almost double in, um, or more than double in, in athletes. In terms of diagnosis of cartilage injuries, um, this can be seen on plain film x-rays, but these can also be normal. Um, the MRI uh, scans that we can get are often more sensitive and specific, but really these can be missed with MRI as well. And so therefore arthroscopy is the gold standard. Um, that's when a surgeon goes into the knee and uses a camera to actually look around the knee and look at the different areas of the knee and determine, uh, you know, is there a cartilage lesion within any of the compartments of the knee? And so this is an example of that, um, where we are classifying the cartilage wear of the knee. So this is called the outer bridge criteria, and there's four different grades. So uh, really five different grades. So grade zero would be normal cartilage. Uh, grade one is when there's cartilage with some softening and swelling, and so they'll they'll probe the cartilage to determine if there's softening of this. Grade two is when there might be a partial thickness uh, defect. There might be some fissuring, um, but this does not reach through the bone. Grade three, um, there's fissuring down to the level of the bone, so they might be able to see some of the underlying bone through the cartilage in here. Um, and this would be a level with an area of a diameter of more than 1.5 centimeters. Lastly, uh, if there's frank areas of exposed subchondral bone, this would be an outer bridge grade four criteria. In terms of treatment options for cartilage injuries, um, there can be a conservative approach that's similar to the treatment of osteoarthritis. And this would include activity modifications, um, uh, NSAIDs such as ibuprofen or leave um, to decrease the inflammation in the joint, uh, as well as bracing in order to offload some of the stresses going through that joint. If this doesn't work, um, surgical treatment is often indicated. And again, this is an area that's being highly researched. Um, so a surgeon may go in and debride some of the loose tissues. Um, they can do a microfracture procedure, uh, an OATS procedure, uh, which stands for osteochondral autograft transfer system, um, an ACI procedure, which stands for autologous chondrocyte implantation, um, or an allograft procedure, where um, where they're they're kind of reinforcing that cartilage where um, with with another product. Um, so, in conclusion, 
Osteoarthritis is a very common cause of joint injury. Uh, it causes pain and disability. It has a wide range of treatment options. Uh, new treatment options such as MFAT or stem cells uh, can help with symptoms, but they have not been shown to regenerate cartilage. These are some of the references uh, used for this presentation. And I know that this is a virtual presentation, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions that someone may have um, and provide some, some feedback or discussion. Um, and this is my contact information. Uh, this is where we have a location up at Mayo Clinic Square in Minneapolis. And as you can see, we take care of the, the links as well as the Timberwolves and the Twins here. And I just want to thank everybody uh, for their time.